If it's in the Bible, we want it. If it's not in the Bible, we don't want it. Jesus does not guess about the future. He knows the future. On this channel, we focus on getting ready for the fantastic, glorious, apocalyptic second coming of Jesus Christ and the tribulation prior to that. Most will not be ready for these final apocalyptic, catastrophic, prophetic end time events, but you can be ready. Well, if you think you can handle God's final warning, his final truth for our hour, if you think you can handle it, stay tuned. Okay, just before we dive into this very important topic, I want to get this book into your hands. That is an ebook. Go into the screen. You can download this free book. It's simple to do. Just download this book and uh, a donation is appreciated but not required at this time. But if you do want to stand with us, thank you for your support. Send a check to Forever Free Ministries, PO Box 3101, Weatherford, Texas 76086. Make sure you subscribe to our channel as you don't want to miss any of our future uploads. Okay, so here is some powerful end time final warning from God and from Jesus for the last days. If you think you can handle it, let me read it to you. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And watch this. Zoom in on this part. And who is able to stand? Look here, everybody. Are you going to be standing when Jesus comes at his glorious second coming of Jesus Christ? Will you and I be found standing? Well, if you think you can handle it, what is the truth? The truth is that most people will not be ready when Jesus comes in the sky. That's why our channel, Amazing Prophecies, is devoted to have a sharp focus upon the cross of Christ and the coming of Christ. The two C words, the cross and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so let's go back to the screen. So most will not be standing when the sky opens up to the glorious return of Christ. As a matter of fact, God describes his end time truth, his end time people as not being fully ready in the last days. So if you think you can handle the book of Revelation, we'll hear some more from Revelation. This is speaking to Laodicea, the seventh church, representing God's people in the last days who are professing Christianity. But then we know that Jesus knows what's really going on. He said, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, that's the spiritual uh, diagno diagno diagnosis test. If you think you can handle the truth, here it is, everybody. Because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold, that's his love and faith that was, that was refined and that was um, tested on the cross. So I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Okay, look here, everybody. So the Bible is very clear that in the last days, most Christians are blind and they think they're going to go to heaven and they think they're right with God. But the truth is many who think they're right with God are not right with God. How do you know you're right with God? Two things. You believe your sins are forgiven at the foot of the cross and you're accepted just the way you are. You believe that Jesus Christ saves you by his precious blood. Number two, you follow Jesus Christ. Now, many think they have the first part nailed down. That is, they believe that Jesus died for them and they think, well, that's it. Well, 
That's the foundation of our salvation. But then our salvation must be followed. That is to say, we accept Christ and then we walk with Christ. Walking with Christ is very important. We can't be saved if we just say, well, my sins are forgiven. If your sins are truly forgiven, you don't want to walk in sin. You want to walk in righteousness. You want to live the life of Jesus Christ. So it's very clear. You need two things to be, to, to be saved, to go into heaven, to be, to be able to enter paradise. There's only two things you need, but you need both of them. That is, believing that Jesus died for you. Secondly, live out his life. Live. If he died for you, you die with him. That is, you die to self. You don't want to live for self. You want to live for Jesus Christ. So it's very simple, these two things. Believe in Jesus' blood and then apply it to your life by walking in righteousness. So our standing before God is forgiveness. Our walking with God is allowing Jesus to change us. Sanctification. It's a big word, but it's very simple. Becoming more Christ-like. We take the name Christian. What's the root word? Christ. To take the name Christian means we're walking with Jesus. We want to look like Jesus. We want to talk like Jesus. We want to act like Jesus. We want to behave like Jesus. We want people to see Jesus in us. So we want to walk closely with Jesus. So let's go back to the screen. So Jesus says to the seventh church, To us in the last days, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Hear that? If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine or sup with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also ever came and sat down with my father in his throne. It's clear from these verses You can't be saved unless you allow Jesus to come into your heart and you sup with him. That is, you're in constant communion with him. That is to say, he has become your Savior and Lord, and you're in communion with him. There's closeness there. Christ dwells in your heart. And so then it says here that Jesus wants to help us to overcome. Well, that's a daily experience. (laughs) That's an hourly experience, a moment-by-moment experience where we allow Jesus to overcome sin in us. That is to say, he gives us victory. He gives us victory over self and sin and over the evil one. He gives us total victory. We have to believe that we walk in victory. We cannot go to heaven if we're cherishing sin. We must cherish Jesus instead. So only those who overcome by the blood of the Lamb will be saved at last. The greatest battle fought is with self. Look here, everybody. Mark Fox, I can testify that I can't gain victory in my own self. My victory is in looking to Jesus, looking and trusting in him with all of my heart. And I can testify that I know the greatest battles I fight are with self. Self doesn't want to die. That's why we need Jesus to help us to deny ourselves and take up his cross and follow him. Back to the screen. So the Bible makes it very clear that God's people in the last days are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the lamb. So one day we will be following the lamb wherever he goes when we go to heaven. But it's also true now. Now we want to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. This is explosive truth from the book of Revelation. Now, unfortunately, many are deceived about their true spiritual condition before God. But Jesus makes it clear that their only hope, (laughs) excuse me, their only hope is to repent of sins and to open the door of their heart to Jesus. Jesus offers the gift of salvation. Jesus commands and promises us power to overcome sin and self. This is good news that we can have complete power to overcome sin and self one hour at a time. Friends, believe it or not, ready or not, Jesus Christ is going to appear at his glorious second coming of Christ. You can be ready. That's why we have our channel, Amazing Prophecies. We want to be ready for these end-time apocalyptic events. We know that God is working, but most people are changing in the wrong direction. We need to look to the Son of Righteousness as sunflowers 
at times turned to the sun. So even most Christians will not be allowed into heaven. And here's why. They didn't take up the cross. They believed Jesus died for them, but they weren't willing to die with Jesus Christ. So who doesn't want to go to heaven? Of course, any sane person wants to live forever in a blissful state of happiness. What the Bible teaches us is that most people are not going to heaven. As a matter of fact, a small percentage of even professed Christians are actually going to, to, to heaven. Ultimately, small percentage. <clears throat> but why? In this video, you will discover why so many Christians will not make it to heaven. You will also discover how to make sure that you are going to heaven. In these last days, most people are deceiving themselves about their eternal destination. Most people feel they're good enough to go to heaven, but most people are not going to heaven. So there is a real disconnect. The evil one is deceiving people about themselves and their true condition and their eternal destination. Jesus wants us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are going to heaven <clears throat> to be with God forever and ever. There are many shocking things that Jesus said when he was here 2,000 years ago. In this video, we will focus on a few very shocking things that Jesus said that are so relevant for us living in the last days. He says that lukewarm people are going to be lost unless they repent. Now listen to this shocking warning of Jesus for us to heed. Not everyone, <laughs> excuse me, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So what a tragic fate many will face because although they were doing many good works, they were not truly surrendered to Christ and truly following him with all of their heart. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the gate, narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. But let me tell you something. Look here. You can be among the few. Don't be discouraged. You say, Mark, I fail and I fall. Get up. Get up. Trust in Jesus. He's always ready to forgive. He cares for you. He cares for me. And we can make it. We can make it if we just are. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Psalms 46, verse 10. Our salvation depends upon allowing Jesus to save us one hour at a time. Let's keep going. For many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew 20, 16. So anyone can claim to be a disciple of Christ. Therefore, there must be some clear Bible test of a true disciple of Christ. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So most Christians who know about Jesus dying on the cross are not taking up their cross daily in following Jesus with all their heart and with all their soul. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all, Jesus says, forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me, Matthew 10:38. In order to understand what it means to take up our cross daily and follow Jesus, all, the, all, all we have to do is to look at the life and death of Jesus. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have set, come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Well, what do we do then? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Jesus did it. And we have to do it, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, Hebrews 12, 2. 
For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. 1 Timothy Peter 2.21 Taking up your cross as a true disciple of Christ means that you are totally surrendering your heart to him. It means that you are now living for Jesus. So let's get into it. So number one, die to self and sin. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Uh, what did Jesus say? But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her, like porn, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right hand causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. So you can handle this truth in, through the Holy Spirit. So carrying your cross in the last days is everything. That's everything. That's one of the key teachings of the Bible, that we must surrender self to Jesus Christ if we want to be saved. We must take up our cross. And so then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Take up the cross and follow me means that we are willing to die to self in order to follow Jesus. This is what we would call dying to self. It's a high call to absolute full surrender. Jesus commands us to cross bearing. He said, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life from me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very soul, his self? Although this high call is challenging, the eternal war is worth it all. So many will put forth effort to be saved, but they fall short of a full and complete surrender of self to Christ. They were not dead to sin and self. They still clung to some cherished sin. They were, they were compromising with the world. They were not taking up their cross and following Jesus with all of their heart and soul. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Listen to this. Oh, I love this. This is powerful. But Christ lives in me. Look here, everybody. Thank God. Look here, Jesus, Jesus, look at me, and I'm telling you this, Jesus Christ lives in us. That's the good news. He's living in us. So whatever you face, whatever you encounter, whatever temptations are hurled at you, I can tell you this, that Christ is ready to forgive. And remember, Christ dwells in your heart. Let's go back to the screen. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How should we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we should, what everybody? Walk in newness of life. You've heard the expression, oh, get a life. No, get eternal life at the foot of the cross. So walk. So if we believe in Jesus, we've died to self. All right, baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we are spiritually resurrected and we walk in newness of life. We live a new life. We don't want to live in sin. We don't want to walk in darkness. We want to walk in the light of Jesus. And so likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6, 11, I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily, the Apostle Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. What about Jesus? In the Garden of Gethsemane, he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus was fully surrendered to his Father's will at all times. Jesus made this decision the costly decision to sacrifice his life for sinners. He accepted the bitter cup of separation from God, the wrath of God against sin. Jesus was committed to go to Calvary and spill his precious blood on the cross. He would give his all, nothing held back. Number two, willing to suffer for Christ. 
These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation and persecution and temptations. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Praise God. Look here, everybody. You know what this is saying? This is saying that Jesus' victory is my victory. The evil one is a defeated foe. You and I can go forth in newness of life. We can be of good cheer because Jesus said he overcame and he promises to live on the inside of us and to overcome sin in us. Hallelujah. Some get excited about football. Some get excited about hockey. Some people get excited about baseball. Some people get excited about uh, basketball. I get excited about eternal life. That's the finishing line. When you make it to heaven, you've made it. And you and I can believe right now that we have eternal life. Hallelujah. Go back to the screen with me. Here we go. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me, away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And we can, we can receive help of holding angels. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So when you feel discouraged, think about what Jesus endured for you. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Don't give up. Don't give up, everybody. Don't give up. Don't give up. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, Philippians 1.29. What about the Apostle Paul? He said, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among the false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things which comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. 2 Corinthians 11, 23-29. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Philippians 3, 8. In other words, he was willing to go through whatever suffering because he loved Jesus and wanted to continue to follow Jesus and die daily. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep, hallelujah, what I've committed to him until that day. Praise God. 2 Timothy 1.12. I have fought the good fight, Paul said. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but to all, also to all who have loved his appearing. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3, 12. So don't be surprised. When you choose to not be godly, I'm sorry, when you choose to be godly and not worldly, you will face opposition, ridicule, false accusations, harassment, criticism, and all sorts of negative response. Taking up your cross means that you know the world is against you and you still choose to follow Jesus no matter what the cost. So in the last days, the dragon, the devil, was enraged with the woman, the church, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, the remnant, who keep the commandments of God, including the Sabbath, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, Revelation 12, 17. What about Moses? Paul said about Moses, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward, Hebrews eleven twenty six. In other words, he valued, followed Jesus Christ no matter what. But to follow, that is, the Messiah to come. It's to serve God in all that he would do. Moses gladly gave up all the glamour, the praise, the vain glory of his position in Egypt in order to be used by God to help the children of Israel. Number three, willing to die for Christ. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, that is, the worthiness of Jesus, his merits of Jesus, and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. All the disciples were martyred except John, who was banished on the Isle of Patmos, of course, um, Judas Iscariot hung himself and then Matthias took his place so there were 12 disciples apostles 
11 were martyred and John was banished on the Isle of Patmos. He, and then in the last days about the Antichrist and about the false prophet working together, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship, false worship that is, worship the image of the beast to be killed. So there's a death decree and there will be some martyrs in, in, in the last days, but God will keep his people. And so number four, living a humble life of self-denial in contrast to living for self. A true disciple of Christ will live a life of self-surrender, self-denial. Jesus, as our example, took up his cross daily and followed his Father in the path of self-denial. Jesus' life was focused on saving souls to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus lived a life of self-forgetfulness. Jesus left for us an example of self-surrender. Jesus lives a life, lived a life of self-denial. He completely humbled himself and died a horrible death on the cross. Jesus did not live for himself. Jesus was emptied of self. Jesus put us before himself. Jesus took up his cross and finished the work that he was called to do. He was born to die and he knew it. At every step, Jesus was so fully surrendered to his Father that he worked energetically for the salvation of souls. Well, how did Jesus reveal humility and putting himself aside in the upper room at the Last Supper on that Thursday night? He washed the disciples' feet. In other words, he humbled himself before the disciples and he told the disciples to do what he did to humble themselves. He even said that there should be foot washing ordinances uh, periodically, and that's advocated in John 13. So Jesus is our example. By this, he said that night at the upper room, by this all men shall know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so let this mind be in you, Paul said, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He humbled himself what? And became obedient to what? To the point of death, even what? The death of the cross. Number five, make sacrifices for the good of others. We must be willing to sacrifice to Jesus. That includes time, money, influence, dreams, hopes, everything that we have or are. The rich young ruler told Jesus that he kept the commandments of God, but then Jesus pointed out that he needed to be unselfish with his money to truly be right with God. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell what you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful. For he had great possessions. In other words, he wanted Jesus, but he didn't want him enough to make a sacrifice. And so then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and watch this and come and take up the cross and follow me. But he refused to take up the cross. Look here, everybody. Are you willing to take up the cross? Are you willing to take up the cross? What does that mean? That means you come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I believe you died for me. Jesus, I believe you, you're a risen savior. Jesus, I believe you intercede for me. And Jesus, I believe in you. And Jesus, I'm willing to take up my cross to follow you. No matter what I have to give up, no matter what the sacrifices, no matter what trials I need to endure, Jesus, I still want to follow you with all my heart. Hallelujah, hallelujah, is that your desire? You see, in the last days, there's just two groups of people. There's the rich young ruler type people that for whatever reason, they turn their back on Jesus. Oh, they might even profess to be a Christian, but they're not truly following the, the path of self-denial. They're not fully surrendered to Christ. They're holding on to some sin, or they just refuse to follow Jesus and love him with all their heart. They're lukewarm. And so, but then the second group are those who say, Jesus, you are worth it. Jesus, you are worth it. Jesus, thank you for dying for me on the cross. Jesus, I'm willing to take up my cross. Jesus, so look here, everybody. I'm here to tell you. Look at my eyes. I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ died for you. Died for you. Friends, what's the Bible teaching? Look here. What is the Bible teaching? The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ 
is coming very, very soon. And we want to be ready. So as you look here, everybody, this is my heartfelt appeal. This is my appeal. Give your heart to Jesus. Oh, my Father in heaven, help us to be willing to take up the cross to follow you with you helping us to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. This is Mark Fox signing off for now. Remember, Jesus died for you.